we did it. We got through Thanksgiving. How many of you, you had a great Thanksgiving? It was really good. How many of you, it was terrible? I'm kidding, don't raise your hands. You could be sitting next to them and that would, Kurt's office would be real busy this coming week. Um, I, I'm always amazed at uh, just uh, the calendar, and I know that sounds weird, but work with me for a second, because it feels like there are just built-in moments throughout the year that are due for pause and reflection, and uh, Thanksgiving is certainly one of them, Christmas is another one of those, and um, he here's what I know about you and I, is that if we're not intentional and deliberate, we will drift, People drift, and so thank God for the calendar because it provides those mar mile markers along the way for us to kind of reflect and to reevaluate. But, but think in your own life. I mean, you, certainly you've drifted, I've drifted. We all have had really good goals, especially, by the way, how those New Year's resolutions working out for you for 2023? <laughs> it's crunch time. Okay, we drift, you're with me, we drift. Some of you are like, oh, crunch time, like crunch, you get it, okay. So uh, we're, in, we're in like this, this Thanksgiving Christmas transition thing, and here's my fear, is that for us as a church, we check the box and we say, great, I was thankful for the day and for three weeks because we did a little series leading up to it. Now we transition into Christmas, and Christmas, we all know the goal is to get more this year than you did last year. I, okay, uh, the goal for Christmas is not that. Um, I won't talk about what the goal is because that's, that's next week's series, but I'll give you a hint. It is about Jesus. Amen. So that's kind of a big deal. Um, but we're in this in-between section, aren't we? It's not Thanksgiving and it's not yet Christmas, and so we're stuck here. And here's why I bring up the drift. is because the temptation will be for you and I to go back to what is familiar and what is comfortable. And if we're not intentional and deliberate with it, we will have checked the box of Thanksgiving and we will check the box of Christmas and we're off to the New Year's and we have resolutions that will inevitably stop in February. And we will have year after year after year and we look in the rearview mirror of our life and we go, nothing really changed. We got through it. And buckle up again because 2024, we're gonna get through the holiday season once again. So we go back to the calendar and you say there are mile markers along the way for us to hit the pause button and to reflect. And my hope, my goal is that as you look over this past year, you say, wow, I had a year where I was more thankful this year than I was last year. That's the goal. That's the goal. And so when Christmas rolls around, there's going to be some other goals. But one of those goals might be I was more generous this year than I was last year. It's a sign of growth. It's a sign of progress. But again, if we're not intentional, if we're not deliberate, we will drift. We will drift away from those things. And the temptation is that Thanksgiving and Christmas can simply be holidays that we check boxes and we move on with our life. Instead of experiencing some change, some transformation, and some growth. And so um, that's kind of where we're headed this morning is this big transition between Thanksgiving and Christmas. And, and really, here's the big idea is that our thanksgiving would lead to grateful sharing. Because think about it. We have all these things that we're thankful for. We spent three weeks on this. We have all these things that we're thankful for. The natural progression of a thing that you're thankful for is sharing it with somebody else. The, the goal is this. As a Christian, you say, this is the item. Pick whatever item it is. This is the item that has been a blessing in my life. I'm so thankful for this item. And we can either hoard it and hide it from people, or we can bless other people with the item that has blessed us. So they too can be thankful and grateful for it. Are you with me? Amen. It is, I, I'm so thankful for this because it has helped bless my life. I want to be a grateful sharer, 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 sharer. 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 One who shares <laughs> with someone else. Someone Google the right way to say that and, and get back to me. I'm not quite sure what that is. But but do you understand, like, how weird if I were to, like, hold on to this precious thing and go, it's, it's just mine. And everyone's like, what do you got over there? And I'm like, don't worry about it. It's mine. And you're like, well, could, you seem to have a lot of joy and happiness. Could I have that? And you say, well, no, get your own. There's a Black Friday sale, and you're like, well, I missed it on Black Friday. Well, thank God there's Cyber Monday. Like, who does that? No, no, no. Our Thanksgiving leads to grateful Sharing. We want to be people who share greatly the things that have blessed us. We want to go and bless 
other people. And here, here's why this is important and why this isn't just kind of a wash Sunday, just a drive by, check the box for attendance Sunday. Here's why this is really important. We will start hearing songs on the radio that say it's the most wonderful time of the year. I just want to remind us, there's a lot of us in this room watching online and a lot of people in our society that this is not the most wonderful time of the year for them. This is a dark time of year for them. And so I did some Googling and you can do it too. These are not hard to come by, but I wanted to share with you five factors contributing against mental health this holiday season. Now, don't, don't write them down on your notes because other people can peek and look on, at your notes, but just intuitively, just mentally, figure out what boxes you're checking. You ready? Uh-oh, you ready? Here's the first one, number one, financial pressure. Did anyone overspend on their budget for Black Friday? Okay, hold on. Y'all have a budget, even if you don't know what it actually is. Y'all have a budget. And again, may I remind you that if you did not overspend on Black Friday, you've got Cyber Monday sales still going on. So you have a second chance to do that if you want. There's this pressure because again, this Christmas has to be bigger and better than last Christmas. Could you imagine if we had less gifts this year? Oh, our children would not love us. Isn't it weird that we think that way? Okay, that's the first one. Here's the second one. You ready? Social expectations. You and I have so many appointments and obligations that we need to go to. There's work parties, there's friend parties, there's small group parties, there's church parties. And if you serve in a department within the church, you have the department church party. Then you have a social calendar and then you have a family thing and then you have extended family. And then there's kind of a lot going on. Heaven forbid you have a day for yourself or your family. And here's, here's the problem with all this stuff. You get overbooked like crazy and you're like, ah, how do we do it? You and I have to decide who we are going to intentionally let down <laughs> because we will not be able to make it to their party because there's so much going on. Pick your poison. Do you, by the way, this is, this is just the first two. Are you already feeling a little stress and anxiety? Yes. You have to say no to somebody. And then you and I, because we like people and we generally want them to like us, we're a little bit nervous about how they're going to respond because we're going to hurt their feelings. And they have expectations of us. And we're not going to meet those expectations. Uh-oh, now we got some problems. Number three, are you ready? Yes. For everyone in this room that is being invited to all of these parties, there's a segment of the room that isn't invited to any party. And this contributes to loneliness and isolation during this season. Could you imagine being in a room full of people and not being invited? Could you imagine going to a church service at arguably one of the biggest churches in the county and not knowing a single person? I mean, sure, you've made eye contact with them, probably for weeks. But knowing them, being known by them, seeing them. Loneliness and isolation, not, not everybody has um, family close by. Not everyone has generation after generation in the hometown. Um, which goes into the fourth point, grief and loss. Some people who did have family have lost family. And this year, we're all reminded that once again, so-and-so isn't with us. And when we gathered at Thanksgiving, it felt a little different. Not like it was growing up. And Christmas, we'll gather and it's, it's going to feel different. And, and maybe for some of us, the, the struggle is, is too difficult. So the temptation is to say no to that party. But we know if we say no to that because the struggle is too difficult, we'll be met with a lot of questions. So then we have to worry about that. And it's the most wonderful time of the year, sort of. 
Really, it's the most wonderful time of the year until it's not. And if those weren't heavy enough, here's the fifth one, and this was new to me. Um, I originally grew up in Southern California, so this is new to me. Seasonal affective disorder? Did you know that's a thing? Again, uh, I'm born and raised, grew up in Southern California. I had heard of foolishness. (laughs) I'm so sad because the sun isn't out. I was like, okay, that's weird. And then I moved here, and I'm so sad that the sun isn't out. (laughs) So, yeah, we bought the happy light and the vitamin D and whatever else you're supposed to do to just kind of make it happy. But I had no idea that I would wake up in the morning and just kind of (sighs) go until about 10 o'clock until the sun comes out. And then, you know, for the short hour and a half window that the sun is out, it feels pretty good. So why, why am I walking us through all this stuff? Because this stuff actually matters. It's, for a lot of us, it's not the most wonderful time of the year. This is a dark time of year. This is a challenging time of year. What do we do with that? Do we just bury it way down and sing the songs and yay, Merry Christmas, and we just, we just keep on keeping on and we get through it? Or, or is there a better way? And I'm convinced there's a better way. And it is, in fact, the the big idea that we're trying to discuss this morning. It's this idea that Thanksgiving leads to grateful sharing. And here's why this is so crucial. Sharing requires me, an object, and another human. That's one way to chip away at the loneliness this season, is to share something with someone. Because it says, I see you. And even in the sharing, if it's something as simple as I, I, I lend you a tool, there's an exchange, there's an interaction. We now have a commonality. We both need tools. <laughs> what a great foundation for a friendship. <laughs> this stuff really matters. Our Thanksgiving should and needs to lead to generous and glorious and grateful sharing. It matters deeply. So you go, okay, sharing, that's such a big question. Why do I share and where do I share it and how do I share it? I'm so glad you asked. Number one in your notes. You ready? Number one in your notes. Here we go. Number one, share the gospel. Are you thankful for the gospel? Has it made an impact on your life? I would encourage us to share the gospel with people this dark holiday season. We could be giving people tremendous hope in a difficult, difficult time. I want to read a passage for you. It's 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. And when I was growing up, uh, this was used a lot in like debates. We're like, you need to show that you're right and that they're wrong. But work with me for a second. First Peter chapter 3, verse 15. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord, or worship Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But, this is a very big but, but do this with gentleness and, what's that word? Do it with gentleness and respect. And like I said, when I was coming up, it was like, here's the debate. So like, you need to just, you know, show that you're right and they're wrong, but like, don't be too aggressive with it because you don't want them to feel bad. You just want them to know that you're right and you're wrong. I want to take this idea, and while people may not come to you and say, why do you put your hope, faith, trust, life in the hands of Jesus Christ, who claims to be Lord and Savior? You may not get asked that directly, but if you do, that door has been kicked wide open, and by all means, walk through it and share. Most of you, as we interact with people, we'll come into contact with people who are very lonely. And they'll say, there's something different about you. We'll come in contact with people who are grieving, who have, who have suffered significant loss. And if they know our story, they'll know that we have experienced the same. And they'll say, but you're, you're handling it different. We get to gently and respectfully share them, what's that phrase? Give the reason for the hope. What a beautiful gift to give people in a dark time is hope. We can go and give them the hope of Jesus Christ. And so you say, well, how do I actually do that? Is it the four spiritual laws? Do I need to take the class evangelism explosion? Do I need to, what do I do? How do I actually share my faith with someone? It's real easy. You ready? 
Super easy. Don't, don't overcomplicate it. Keep it very, very simple. Tell people what life was like before you met Jesus. That's the first thing. The second thing is tell people how you met Jesus. It could be, boom, one miraculous moment, or it could be, in my case, years of progress into following and finding Jesus. And then the third thing is tell them what your life is like with Jesus. Life before God, how you found God, what life is like now with God. Very simple. Everyone can do it. And don't tell them that your life is perfect now because it's not. <laughs> it's not. And when we, we come across and we tell people that I found Jesus and everything is cured and fine and blessings fall from the sky, my life is perfect. There's, there's such, a, ca there's such a, a, a gap from that. It's like the person who's hurting is here and your life being perfect is over there and you're asking them to make this giant leap. They can't do it. They can't see themselves living a perfect life, but they can see themselves living with Jesus. That's the goal is that. You say, the reason I am able to have hope in a difficult season is because of Jesus Christ. Can I tell you what he's done for me? Because I think he might be able to do the same for you. And then you just have a conversation. But we do it again, again, remember, 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 we do it with gentleness and with respect. Did you know that the holiday season is the perfect time to invite people to church and share your faith with them? Did you know that? It's baked into our, our calendar, our system, our way of life. It's a, like a mile post along the highway of like, oh, it's the holiday season. I should invite people to church. Listen, I'll give you some stats and we'll kind of walk through it a little bit. So in a recent poll of a thousand Americans, I know that's not much, but follow me. A thousand Americans, Lifeway Research found that six out of 10, six out of 10 typically attend church at Christmas time. That's a lot of people, yeah. six out of 10. The population in Linden, we're gonna round and make, af, make math very simple. Population of Linden is 16,000 people. That means 9,600 people from Linden plan to attend church. Isn't that great? Okay, I got some bad news. That means that 6,400 people from Linden are not planning on going to church. Where there's bad news, there's also opportunity. We'll keep going. Here's another stat, another stat, excuse me. But among those who don't attend church at Christmas time, a majority, 57%, say they would likely attend if someone they knew, catch, catch this, invited them. 57% said, yeah, I'd probably go if I was invited. What does that mean? I'm glad you asked. 57% of 6,400 equals, did you bring your abacus? You got your calculator? No. Carry the one. Some of you younger people are doing new math, trying to figure it out. 50% yeah. <laughs> of 6,400 equals 3,648 people would likely show up to church if we just invited them. Could you imagine? We just had to invite them. And I go, okay. Now, you're like, it's a short little research thing. By Lifeway, only 1,000 people. What if we were half wrong? Yeah. Great question. Glad you asked. What if the stat is wrong? Let's say it's wrong by half. 50% of 3,648 is 1,824. If we just invited people and this stat is 50% wrong, 1,824 people would show up to church this Christmas season. All we have to do is invite them. Amen. Um, do you know what would happen if we had to invite, if we invited 1,824 people? We would have to start two new worship services just to fit them all in here. There's 900, just a little over 900 seats in this building right now. We'd have, to, we'd have to start two services just to house them all. And here's what's funny is technically they would fit, but it would, you wouldn't feel like there was room for you. There's this, I'll, I'll give you a little peek behind the curtain in, in church life. There's this general rule that when your seats are occupied at 80%, people walk in and they go, oh, there's no room for me. Every seat is taken. Because, especially during worship when everyone's standing, because they can't see like the placeholder, the buffer seat where like the purse and the Bible and all that stuff goes, you know what I mean? You're like, I love my neighbor, but I don't, 
love my neighbor. So here's the buffer. It's that whole thing. So they're technically their seats, but it just feels full. So we would have to comfortably fit everyone. We would have to start three new services, which means we would have five services every single week. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Here's what we're thinking. We go, oh, good Lord. That means I have to serve at some services. I have to do a lot of things. No, we're fixated on that. Here's what I want us to be fixated on. That means 1,800 and some 24 people would experience the love of Jesus Christ. Amen. Period. Maybe we'd have to do a couple more church services. We tend to just fix it on, well, now I have to do this and A plus B plus C, blah, 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 and we have to do all this and it's going to inconvenience me in my schedule. No, 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 no. 1,824 people can hear the gospel. They can experience the love of Jesus Christ with people who already know Jesus and, be, and are being transformed by Jesus. This is a really big thing. What can we possibly share with people during a dark time? The hope of Jesus. Amen. For starters, that would be one. And friends, we can do that. What a blessing. What a blessing to host services so other people who don't know Jesus could come into this building and experience him. What, what a blessing. What, what an amazing opportunity. Okay, I got to keep going. Number two in your notes. Number two, share your stuff and things. <laughs> Thanksgiving leads to grateful sharing. Well, what do I share? Just your stuff and things. Hi, my name's Steve and I like stuff. <laughs> Any of you have some things you like? Yeah. No, I didn't ask for cheering. Do you, do you have things you like? <laughs> You're like, we're going to dodge that question. Woo! No, no, no. Yes or no. We all do. Listen to this. Listen to this. Luke 3, verse 11. John answered, anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none. And anyone who has food should do the same. This holiday season, I'm sure you will see them if you drive and exit the freeway. You will see people who do not have food, who do not have shelter, who do not have adequate clothing for this climate. What a wonderful opportunity to go and be the hands and feet of Jesus. And friends, you don't have to drive far. When I was a youth pastor, I said I was born and raised in California. So we took people um, down to LA to Skid Row. Uh, sometimes we'd cross the border, we'd go to Mexico. And we would do hygiene clinics, which means we would shampoo people's hair that hadn't been shampooed in at, at least a month. And we know this because once a month we, we go down there. And that's how often it happened. So you're shampooing people's hair, you're cutting fingernails and toenails, and you're, you're loving on people who have nothing. And we would pass out food and we would pass out clothing. And it was, we'd bring these tables and we would set these things up and we'd lay out all the food and we'd lay out all the clothing and then we would hand out bags to people. And people from these towns would come and we'd form very, very long lines and they'd stand in lines and you'd walk through and you'd take one of these and one of those and one of those till you made it to the end of all the tables. And then guess what? you got to go back in line. And so you see people, it's the third and fourth time going through line, and they're just loading up with things, and just the joy and the excitement, and catch this, the gratitude that someone would go out of their way to see them, to love them, and share with them, we're not doing this because we're great people. We're doing this because we love Jesus. And Jesus told us to love God with every ounce of our being. And he told us to go and love other people. And we want to love you as best we can. And I'm doing this with high school students. I'm doing this with college students. I'm just thinking, like, this, this is what it means to be the hands and feet of Jesus. 3,400 and something pounds, pounds of food our church gathered and it's a fun little competition, but, but don't, don't get lost in the fun little competition. We got 3,460-something pounds of food to go and give to people who do not have food. What, what a beautiful thing for us to do. Man, are you, you thankful for the breakfast you had this morning? Yes. Thanksgiving leads to grateful sharing. So of course we would do this. Why wouldn't we do this? We would absolutely go and share. Now, here's what's fascinating about this is that on a global level, we are all rich. None of us in this room are poor. We just don't always feel rich. 
because we're comparing ourselves to someone else. But this next passage applies to each and every one of us. It's in 1 Timothy chapter 6. This is Paul writing to Timothy. He says, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds and to be generous and willing to what? There it is. That's our word. In this way, in this way, in doing good deeds and generous and willing to share, in this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. What in the world is the life that is truly life? It's not found in our possessions and our things and our stuff. It's found in, what does Paul write? He says, doing good, being rich in good deeds and being generous and willing to share. That sounds like a life with Jesus, doesn't it? It's exactly what's going on here. I, um, like I mentioned, I like stuff and we have things. My wife also likes stuff and she has things. And uh, for the longest time, I thought she was a hoarder because she would keep all of our baby stuff. We don't, we don't have babies. Uh, that ship is long gone. Um, do any of you have a friend that just seems like they're always pregnant? Like they're just having their annual baby? Do you know what I mean? Um, my wife grew up with a friend from elementary school and they have remained like this. And she's that person who just has an annual baby. And I got so frustrated with Darcy and man, she's so good. Uh, she just looked at me. She said that I'm not holding that for us. There's two times a year that her friend comes up with her, her family and her young kids. I'm, I'm holding on to that for them so that they don't, they're out of state. They're not going to bring all their baby stuff. But she's got really young kids. She's got the annual baby. So we're holding on to it for those kids so that they can be blessed with some of the stuff and some of the things that we have. We're not trying to create a little museum in our home. No, no, no. This is just stuff that has been a blessing to our life, and we want to go and bless it with other people. So I I share the story simply to ask you the question, what's some of the stuff? What are some of the things that you have around the house that are not taking up space but some of the things and some of the stuff that are around your house that you're saving for opportunities to go and bless others with. We have to be intentional with this, otherwise we will lose our way. Can I give you the third one? Are you ready? Here's number three, the third thing that we can share with one another. Number three, share your time and friendship. Time and friendship. Y'all have time. We all do. 24 hours, right? Last time I checked, has that number changed? Nope. The problem is, if you're like me, you get stressed out because you're like, okay, I have to go to this meeting, I have to go and do these shoppings, I have to wrap wrap these things, I have to go here, I have to call these people, I have to, I have to, I have to, I have to, I have to. And the problem with that is that it's me focused. I have to. Thanksgiving and Christmas is never a me focused thing. It is a us. My friends from the South, it is a y'all thing. It's, it's the idea that you can have a personal relationship with Jesus, but you cannot have a private one. To be a follower of Christ, to be part of the church, is to be a part of a community, is to care for other people. Jesus said the most important thing we can do in our, with our lives is to love God with all we got and to love others. This holiday season is not about me. It's not about you. It is about God and it is about others. But you're a human being that Jesus loves deeply, so you do get to play a role in it. The goal of Christmas is not to get more stuff. The goal of Thanksgiving is not to eat until we feel like our stomach is going to burst. The goal of Thanksgiving is to be so grateful for the things that God has given us in this life so that this Christmas we could gratefully share those blessings with other people. That's the goal. That's what we're all working towards together. And so this holiday season, as we shop and we do the parties and we, we do what we do, My hope, my prayer is that we get to the end of this and we look back and go, man, I was more thankful this year than I was last year. I shared more this year than I did the previous year. And in fact, I found people who didn't have some of the things that God has blessed me to have. And I was able to share and to give to those people so that they could be blessed the same way that I was blessed. So as we wrap up, The easy application is to say, pick one of those three things and go do it this week. I think the harder, more difficult application is for us to be honest with ourselves, look ourselves in the mirror, and look at other people in this room and say, I'm actually suffering from one of those five that that we read off in the beginning. 
I would love to buy people gifts. I don't have the money. But the pressure is so immense, I feel like I have to go in a tremendous amount of debt to go and bless other people with stuff they quite frankly don't need. Maybe for some of us in this room, it is a lonely season. Some of you, your heart is just heavy because you were reminded once again that Thanksgiving and Christmas, man, dinner is just different because that person is no longer here. So I want to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to help us be honest with ourselves and to be vulnerable with one another. Because it can be so easy for us when we say amen and sing the last song to run out into the lobby. Hey, how's it going? Great. God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. And move about our business. (laughs) I'm asking that we would slow down and we would ask people, hey, how you doing really? You say, fine. You say, no, 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 no. Like, we don't have to have the counseling session here. We may need to meet up for coffee. And listen, if your life is great, you're doing well, there there are no problems, life is good, we need you to encourage us. We do. We're, We're not mad that life is great for you, that God's been blessed. We are really, really excited. We hope to get there too. We're just not there today. And so would you just come down and encourage us? Would you give us hope? Because I'm willing to bet there was a Christmas season where life was not great and it was not the most wonderful time of the year for you. How'd you get through it? More importantly, what did God do in your life during that season? But that requires us to be vulnerable and to say that I'm struggling. The goal is to be more thankful this next year than we were this year. The goal is to be more generous this coming year than we are this year. The only way you and I can do that is to actually open up and share with one another where we're at today. I think so often in church, we think of, I'm gonna go bless those people over there. And can I just encourage us that maybe the people we need to bless are right here I don't want us to assume that life is perfect because we're sitting in a church. Because it's not. And so would you stand with me and I'm gonna pray and I'm gonna ask that God would give us the strength to be vulnerable and the confidence to share it. So that this year someone can be generous with us and help us. And so Father, we come before you We have to acknowledge that you have been so good to us over the years. You truly, truly have. I don't want us to lose sight of that. But God, I have friends in this room that are struggling today. It doesn't mean they're not grateful for what you've done. They're just struggling today. And so Father, I ask that you would work on their hearts and would they be honest with themselves and would they be honest with friends and family And would they be able to say that this year I'm struggling? My life might not be falling apart, but um, I'm certainly not on the mountaintop. Father, give us the strength to be vulnerable with one another. And Father, for us in this room where, where things are good, we are on the mountaintop. We give you tremendous thanks. We give you wonderful praise because we've been in the valley too. Father, when we run into people that are struggling and are vulnerable with us, would you remind us of the things, the blessings that we have, and would we be quick to share those things with other people so that we could bless them? And I pray, Lord, I pray for lives to be changed this season, that Thanksgiving and Christmas would never be about checking a box but I pray that these would remain mile markers, just posts along the road where we can stop, we can reflect, we can pray and look back and think, man, you have been so good to us and we've grown just a little bit more. We pray all these things in the wonderful and the glorious name of Jesus Christ. And the church said,